Chapter 1. I am by birth a Genovese, and my family is one of the most distinguished of that republic. My ancestors had been, for many years, counselors and syndics. A counselor is a lawyer, and a syndic is somebody who is a government official. And my father had filled several public situations with honor and reputation. He was respected by all who knew him for his integrity and indefatigable attention to public business, meaning he's a tireless worker. He doesn't get tired uh, of helping other people. So as you can see, this picture of Victor Frankenstein's father is not drawn realistically. It's very stylized. One of his most intimate friends was a merchant who, from a flourishing state, fell into poverty. This man, whose name was Beaufort, was a, of a proud and unbending disposition and could not bear to live in poverty and oblivion in the same country where he had been, formerly been distinguished for his rank and magnificence. So he's saying that this man Beaufort, once he became poor, and was no longer of a high social status, was embarrassed, and he was not wanting to stick around in Geneva. Having paid his debts, therefore, in the most honorable manner, he retreated with his daughter to the town of Lucerne, where he lived unknown and in wretchedness. My father loved Beaufort with the truest friendship and resolved to seek him out and endeavor to persuade him to begin the world again through his credit and assistance. So Victor's saying his father loved this guy so much like his brother that he wanted to help this guy rebuild his life by giving him money and helping him get more jobs. So as you can see here, this is kind of a steampunk telling of the story. There weren't really these metal devices that people could use to ride around. So again, this is a stylized bit of artwork. Beaufort lay on a bed of sickness, incapable of any exertion. His daughter attended him with the greatest tenderness. Several months passed in this manner. Her father grew worse, and in the tenth month died in her arms, leaving her an orphan and a beggar. This last blow overcame her, and she knelt by Beaufort's coffin, weeping bitterly. When my father entered the chamber, he came like a protecting spirit to the poor girl. And after the interment of his friend, meaning after the burial of Beaufort, he conducted her to Geneva. Two years after this event, Caroline became his wife. So Victor is saying that his father married his best friend Beaufort's daughter two years after Beaufort died. So he was taking care of her and they fell in love. When my father became a husband and a parent, he found his time so occupied by the duties of his new situation that he relinquished or gave up many of his public employments and devoted himself to the education of his children. Of these, I was the eldest and the destined successor to all his labors and utility, meaning he was gonna inherit everything that his father had worked for. But before I continue my narrative, I must record an incident which took place when I was four years of age. So here you see the tallest of the kids on the left is Victor. Then you have his brother and then his baby brother. And we'll be introduced to them in other chapters. You also see his father here teaching and then his mother looking over them. My father had a sister whom he tenderly loved and who had married early in life an Italian gentleman. Soon after her marriage, she had accompanied her husband into his native country. And for some years, my father had very little communication with her. About the time I mentioned, she died. And a few months afterwards, he received a letter from her husband requesting my father to take charge of the infant Elizabeth, the only child of his deceased sister. So Victor's aunt passed away and his uncle couldn't take care of uh, his daughter, Victor's cousin. And so she was sent to live with the Frankenstein family. 
I've often heard my mother say that when she was at that time the most beautiful child she had ever seen and showed signs even then of a gentle and affectionate disposition. These indications and a desire to bind as closely as possible the ties of domestic love determined my mother to consider Elizabeth as my future wife. Now I understand that the idea of cousins being put together in a relationship is disgusting to us in 2020. However, back hundreds of years ago, it was very common in European families that were of uh, noble status or rich families for them to marry cousins to keep the wealth within the family. From this time, Elizabeth Lavenza became my playfellow and, as we grew older, my friend. While there was a great dissimilitude in our characters, there was a harmony in that very dissimilitude. So what Victor's saying is that even though they were very different from each other, they were able to get along very well because of those differences. I delighted in investigating the facts relative to the actual world, meaning science. She busied herself in following the aerial creations of the poets, meaning she was into uh, reading and fiction and imaginative, creative kind of uh, hobbies. The world was to me a secret, which I desired to discover. To her, it was a vacancy, which she sought to people with imaginations of her own. So Victor's saying that while he wants to find out the secrets of the world, Elizabeth, his cousin, thought it was something that she could fill with art and creativity. My brothers were considerably younger than myself, but I had a friend in one of my school fellows who compensated for this deficiency. Henry Clerval was a boy of singular talent and fancy. I remember when he was nine years old, he wrote a fairy tale, which was the delight and amazement of all his companions. His favorite study consisted in books of chivalry and romance, meaning he was into old fashioned uh, medieval knights, um, doing things to win the hearts of, of fair maidens. And when very young, I can remember that we used to act plays composed by him out of these favorite books. I feel pleasure in dwelling on the recollections of childhood before misfortune had tainted my mind and changed its bright visions of extensive usefulness into gloomy and narrow reflections upon self. But in drawing the picture of my early days, I must not omit or forget to mention to record these events which led by insensible steps to my aftertale of misery. So he's saying that all of his mistakes started when he was very young. When I was 13 years of age, I chanced to find a volume of the works of Cornelius Agrippa. I opened it with apathy, meaning that uh, he was bored. It was just something he was just going to look at. The theory which he attempts to demonstrate and the wonderful facts which he relates soon changed this feeling into enthusiasm. A new light seemed to dawn upon my mind and, bounding with joy, I communicated my discovery to my father. Ah, Cornelius Agrippa, my dear Victor, do not waste your time upon this. It is sad trash. So his father's telling him that it's old, dumb, useless stuff that he doesn't need to worry about. If instead of this remark, my father had taken the pains to explain to me that the principles of Agrippa had been entirely exploded and that a modern system of science had been introduced, I should certainly have thrown Agrippa aside. But the cursory glance my father had taken of my volume by no means assured me that he was acquainted with its contents, and I continued to read with the greatest avidity. So what Victor's telling us right now is that his father should have taken the time to explain that Cornelius Agrippa's science had been from hundreds of years before, and that it was all things that had been disproven as fake science. But since his dad just looked at it and, and just kind of blew it off, Victor thought, oh, my dad doesn't know what he's talking about. So he continues to read this work. My first care was to procure the whole works of this author and afterwards of Paracelsus and Albertus Magnus. I read and studied the wild fancies of these writers with delight. 
They appear to me treasures known to few beside myself. So Victor thinks he's discovered this author and these other authors that were talking about science that nobody else really knew about. He thought it was his own little secret and that he was smarter than everybody else. And as we'll see, it's this idea that he's smarter than other people that is going to get him into trouble. It may appear very strange that a disciple of Albertus Magnus should arise in the 18th century, but our family was not scientifical and I had not attended any of the lectures given at the schools of Geneva. My dreams were therefore undisturbed by reality, and I entered with the greatest diligence into the search of the philosopher's stone and the elixir of life. So what Victor is trying to say here is that although his father homeschooled him, his father didn't take the time to teach him about science. And because of that, reading the works of Albertus Magnus and these other scientists who have been dead for hundreds of years, Victor doesn't know that the science that they talk about is not real, that it's fake science. And because of that, he's able to pursue his ideas because he is stubborn and doesn't know any better. So what he's trying to do is find this mythical object called the Philosopher's Stone, which you guys may know as the Sorcerer's Stone from Harry Potter. And there was the idea that this, this stone, this rock, could be used to create a potion or elixir that let people live forever. But the latter obtained my undivided attention. Wealth was an inferior object, but what glory would attend the discovery if I could banish disease from the human frame and render man invulnerable to any but a violent death. So Victor does not want to do this because he thinks he'll make a lot of money if he finds out a way to let people live forever. He's thinking about how it'll make him famous, and he cares more about that than money, because he, his family is already rich. Nor were these my only visions. The raising of ghosts or devils was a promise liberally accorded by my favorite authors the fulfillment of which I most eagerly sought. So Victor's saying that his the scientists he follows, like Albertus Magnus, also say it's possible to raise ghosts or demons, um, which Victor is about to find out is not possible. It's, it's not realistic. He goes on to say, And if my incantations were always unsuccessful, I attributed the failure rather to my own inexperience and mistake than to a want of skill or fidelity in my instructors. So he's saying, I tried it, it didn't work out, um, and I thought it was all because it was my fault, not because the scientists I was following didn't know what they were talking about. He was still believing that it was possible to raise ghosts or dem uh, demons or devils. When I was about 15 years old, we witnessed a most violent and terrible thunderstorm. It advanced from behind the mountains of Jura, and the thunder burst at once with frightful loudness from various quarters of the heavens. I remained, while the storm lasted, watching its progress with curiosity and delight. As I stood at the door, on a sudden I beheld a stream of fire issue from an old and beautiful oak, which stood about twenty yards from our house. And so soon as the dazzling light vanished, the oak had disappeared, and nothing remained but a blasted stump. I never beheld anything so utterly destroyed. The catastrophe of this tree excited my extreme astonishment, and I eagerly inquired of my father the nature and origin of thunder and lightning. And his father says, Electricity! task also devolved upon me when I became the instructor of my brothers. Ernest was six years younger than myself and was my principal pupil. He had been afflicted with ill health from his infancy, through which Elizabeth and I had been his constant nurses. His disposition was gentle, but he was incapable of any severe application. So his brother has been sick from a very young age, uh, and because of that, uh, it's left him unable to do much other than just sit around and read and learn. 
William, the youngest of our family, was yet an infant and the most beautiful little fellow in the world. His lively blue eyes, dimpled cheeks, and endearing manners inspired the tenderest affection. So remember that William was the name of Mary Shelley and Percy Bysshe Shelley's son um, by the time that they had left for Switzerland and when she wrote the story. So she named the character William after her own child. Such was our domestic circle, from which care and pain seemed forever banished. My father directed our studies, and my mother partook of our enjoyments. And that is Victor Frankenstein's family introduced.